Hi, everyone. Warm welcome to our trade talk, Go Canada, today that we are hosting with Norbotten Chamber of Commerce. Swedish companies have many reasons to expand to Canada. And it's the world's 10th largest country or economy with 37 million residents. Uh, during this webinar, we will be listening to leading experts that will tell more about internationalization and Canada as a market and how Swedish companies and other Nordic com companies can, um, can enter the, the Canadian market. I will shortly introduce our uh, speakers for today. And uh, then I will shortly also tell about our uh, Chamber of Commerce and uh, how we work with internationalization before that. Um, we will uh, first listen to our expert, um, how to do business in Canada from the Nordic perspective uh, with Jukka Matikainen, that is managing director at the Nordic Trading House in Canada. After that, we will have investment and business opportunities in Canada with Magnus Almen, that is senior investment officer at, at the Nor for the Nordic region at the Embassy of Canada in Sweden. And then we will go over to successful market entry to Canada uh, with Kristina Kigen, that is country manager, and uh, Patricia Berg Jensen, that is project manager at the Business Sweden in Canada. Uh, at the end, we will have uh, some takeaways and conclusions from today's webinar with my colleague Helen Sundquist that will help me to uh, moderate today's webinar. Uh, just some uh, short words about our Norbotten Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we have three focus areas. It is infrastructure, international trade and business and competence and networks. Uh, we have been working a lot with export uh, in different ways. We have had uh, close cooperation with Finland, uh, where we have also worked towards the Canadian market with both Swedish and Finnish companies last year. And therefore also, for example, with both Business Sweden in Canada and the Nordic Trading House in Canada. Uh, our regional uh, export cooperation uh, consists of amount of uh, different Swedish actors that help companies with internationalization. And uh, uh, due to that, I would like to share a short video about our export cooperation in Norrbotten. I Norrbotten är vi duktiga på att samarbeta. Vi har långt till marknaden och långt till varandra, men vi har nära till människorna. Jag är övertygad om att vi blev nominerade för årets exportregion på grund av att Norrbottens företag har varit väldigt duktiga på att ställa om under pandemin. Vi har haft en stark exportutveckling under många år även innan pandemin. Jag heter Sabrina Zwicki. Jag jobbar på Norrbottens handelskammare som samordnare för internationella affärer och ansvarig för regional exportsamverkan. Vår regionala exportsamverkan har ju den unika fördelen att vi kan jobba även gränsöverskridande mot Finland och Norge. Våra exportföretag i Norrbotten består till största delen av små och medelstora bolag. Naturligtvis har vi också stora aktörer och vi har mycket spetskompetens inom olika områden. Den, den gröna omställningen är ju en tydlig sådan. Men sen har vi också batteribältet och rymd och biltestindustrin som till exempel har funnits i Norrbotten sedan över 50 år tillbaka som, som är väldigt viktiga. För att lyckas med sin regionala exportsamverkan så är det viktigt att ha örat mot marken. Lyssna på företagens behov och ta in också omvärldsbevakning för att veta vad som händer, vad finns möjligheter, vad finns utmaningar. Samtidigt som det är viktigt att inte se varandra som konkurrenter utan som mer som komplement till varandra. Och det tycker jag att vi är extra duktiga på. Vårt nästa steg i regional exportsamverkan men också i det gränsöverskridande som vi jobbar mycket med mot Finland och Norge är att fortsätta jobba med de kluster och spetskompetenser som vi kan se i våra regioner som har en konkurrenskraft 
förstärka den och också korsbefrukta dem med varandra över branscher och över gränser och över klustrarna och också vara mer konkurrenskraftiga tillsammans i, i internationellt sätt. Great. Um, I would like to give the word to the, our first expert, Jukka Matikainen from the Nordic Training House in Canada. Thank you all and uh, good afternoon and uh, good morning to some, some people who might be here in, uh, here in North America. So for the next uh, 30 minutes, I will be talking about business development in North America uh, and in Canada. During the presentation, I will bring up uh, many observations uh, that I have made both here in Canada and Europe, where I have uh, worked. I have done many projects with uh, people from uh, from Scandinavia uh, recently and in my previous roles, and I have tried to highlight the most uh, critical observations. There are some people in the audience who have a sales background, so matters will surely be in some extent familiar to them. Some of these things do not apply only to the North American market, but are universal. However, the significance of these points I raise may be more important here in North America, where competition is uh, tough in uh, many ways. So the goal of this presentation is to provide uh, insights on approaching business development uh, in North America and to share observations that can help overcome uh, challenges and obstacles in expanding business here. The first area of focus is how to find new customers and a brief discussion on sales channels. The next area is business culture. And the third area of focus is communication, presentation, and sales techniques. Before uh, jumping on the chapters, uh, I will give a quick introduction on my background. So most likely, most of you haven't heard about us. We are a small company based out of Vancouver, Canada. We're a team of five people, and we help Nordic B2B companies uh, with their business development needs in the US and Canada. My background is in sales, marketing, business development, and corporate strategy. We have done dozens of business development projects uh, and market research projects for Finnish and Swedish companies and organizations in many industries. For example, construction, mining, seaports, clean tech, forestry, EV charging, and, and so on. So here are our customers from the past couple of years. Approximately 40% of the projects have been for the Canadian market and the rest uh, for the US market. Uh, the customers are typically small and medium-sized companies with revenues ranging from a few million uh, to several hundreds of millions of euros. In addition, in addition to projects to private companies, we have carried out various types of projects for the public sector, including benchmarking activities and other types of market research projects. And then we have hosted lots of delegations and made the travel arrangements for them. We also have a four-year consulting agreement with the Business Finland for research in forest bioeconomy, clean tech and seaport related matters. Uh, in uh, North America. I would like to say a few words about myself. So I have a background in industrial engineering and a master's degree in business administration with a focus on finance. About 12 years ago, before moving abroad, I worked in UPM's uh, corporate strategy department, where I did lots of projects on researching new business opportunities. Since then, my career has taken me to Australia, England, and Canada and my career st started in strategy and business development, then moved into product marketing. And after that, I transitioned within the company to technical direct sales, I was here in Vancouver. And in my last role, I worked for 3M, where I was looking after some of their distributors in the automotive sector. So now it's time to move on the actual uh, topic uh, of the day. So typically, uh, my clients are Finnish SMEs uh, or, or some Swedish and then some governmental clients who have decided to explore or enter the North American market. They usually start by asking if we have experience in their industry and uh, ready contacts. Um, after a brief conversation, the client realizes that it is very unlikely to find a such a person who has direct contacts 
with their ideal customer companies, especially with the individuals who make purchasing decisions. So some, someone might have some contacts, but they're not the, not the Nordic company's ideal customers. So therefore, finding customers is a process. So many Nordic companies start by participating in trade shows and hope to get a few leads from there. However, trade shows can be expensive and it is a, of a gamble whether they will generate leads and more importantly, convert them into customers. So that's why I advise considering a different perspective. So do you want to customers, uh, do you want customers who happen to walk by our booth, perhaps lured by candies or free pens, or would you rather allocate resources to finding and contacting the most suitable customers for your business in North America? So there are various uh, challenges uh, typically involved in finding new customers, but there are a few of the major ones. So firstly, resource allocation, undertaking such a project is a time consuming exercise. Nowadays, everyone, everyone is busy and often these tasks falls on, on the sales team. The second challenge is uh, related to that data acquisition. So the world is full of information, but finding the right information can be difficult. Uh, we may find potential customers, but how do we know if they are the best ones and most suitable ones? So a systematic and comprehensive approach is crucial, but it can be quite challenging for someone inexperienced or new to this. So defining information needs and knowing the availability of different types of information is also invaluable. And once the information is found, how to compile it into spreadsheets from multiple sources can be a task itself. So processing information also requires expertise, tools, and time. So almost uh, regardless of the industry, there are thousands of potential customers in North America. So nowadays, there is a lot of information available on platforms like LinkedIn, Facebook, Yellow Pages, YouTube, magazines, company websites and so on. So the question is how to find the right ones and prioritize them effectively. So typically we gather preliminary information partially through automated means and then later on in the project, lots of manual work is required. So depending on the, spe the specific customer cases. So let's take an example. So there's our approximately 33 million companies in North America, and 1.2 million of that number are, are Canadian companies. So those are the rough numbers, but uh, giving you an idea. So in one project, we found roughly 1,000 companies that met our high-level criteria for prospective clients. So how loosely criteria are set should depend on your company's sales process. So it is crucial uh, to define precisely what you are looking for because it's a huge market and how to segment them and how to prioritize them for the sales team. So you have to consider all those factors. So if the process is properly done and customers are prioritized, typically in the end of the process, there will be roughly, I mean, it can be 20 customers or 500 companies, depending on your type of business and the industry. So this is, um, Quite obvious that you can always try to do projects on your own, but the end result may be not as, as good. So it's worth considering when it's reasonable to do it yourself and when it's better to let professionals handle it. When it comes um, to tasks like segmenting and prioritizing potential those potential customers, it requires expertise, resources, and systematic approach, as I mentioned. But and and, and those um, will ensure accuracy and effectiveness. Also access to a wide range of information sources is very, very important. And uh, there are so many different information sources available for North American markets. So as mentioned earlier, it's also important to consider where to allocate the company's resources. So the time of salespeople is valuable, and especially if you are flying in, flying out. So it's costing money. So it is not worth uh, using uh, it for a project that takes a few months. So it is probably better to have the sales team focusing on what they what they are most valuable for the company, which is which is obviously sales. 
So our process uh, for finding customers consists of six stages. Uh, it all begins with defining the information needs, determining what kind of companies are desired to be found and what information is sought about them. So the next is the creation of a long list. A large number of companies are gathered that could potentially be customers. Then unsuitable companies are eliminated and the remaining ones are segmented and prioritized. And lastly, contact information is sought for the selected companies. So let's dive a bit deeper into this process uh, buying through a case example that we did uh, for North American market. So sometime back, we conducted a project for a group of sawmill companies. And um, we were searching for customers on the East Coast of the US, but the approach would be the same for the Canadian market. So the first stage is uh, defining um, the information needs. So it all starts with defining the ideal customer, what criteria determine an ideal customer and how are customers segmented and prioritized. So typically basic information about companies is desired, such as website, uh, uh, address, revenue, and business type. So in, ad in addition, uh, additional information can be extracted from the product portfolio, for example, when selling lumber, it is important to know if the prospective customer already deals with the similar product. Other aspects of the customer can also be defined, such as whether they claim to be innovative, if, happen if you happen to sell new technology. So what kind of production technology do they use, claim to use? Are environmental concerns emphasized as important values? And lastly, decision-maker information is important. So who is the most relevant decision maker, what contact information is desired, such as LinkedIn, email, or phone number. So it is important to consider what is relevant and prioritize efforts accordingly. So this way, the project workload and budget can be managed effectively. And also, to one, to, in addition to all those factors, you should think about the geography. It's a huge country and um, if, if you fly from coast to coast, it's something like seven hours. So we have a huge geography, lots of companies. So maybe you choose one of the provinces um, to start with or a few of them. So the next uh, step is uh, creating a long list of potential customers. So depending on the information needs, relevant data sources need to be considered. They can be paid or, or, or um, free. So in this project example, we found and evaluated approximately 8,000 potential customers who might be interested in buying lumber from Nordic countries. So from that initial pool, a final database was compiled, considering of 200, 200 highly prioritized customers and nearly 500 companies belong to other interesting segments. So eliminating um, irrelevant customers is crucial. So it is important to establish criteria for filtering as, as the project uh, progresses. For example, revenue can be a convenient metric as it, as it is objective. So defining clear criteria for filtering and prioritizing customers helps to streamline the process and focus on the most, prom most promising prospects. So in addition to revenue, many other other criteria are applied to ensure efforts are focused on the most relevant and highest potential customers. So next is, uh, it is beneficial to segment the companies. Segmentation is crucial from the perspective of sales and marketing, and it should follow the company's established practices for segmenting customers in other markets. So in this example, there may be segments such, such as agents, traders, manufacturers, building material wholesalers, et cetera. So next comes to the prioritization stage. So the project generates a large number of potential customers, but not all customers are equally interesting. Therefore, it is important to prioritize them it is also advisable to carefully consider prioritization from a strategic perspective. So do you want to ease easy deals, big long-term customers, the most profitable customers, highest, high, highest volume customers, and so on? 
So in the case of sawmill example, the assumption was made that if someone is already importing similar lumber from Europe, why wouldn't the customer consider purchasing Nordic lumber as well? Therefore, understanding the product portfolio and the target market was crucial in the project. Once the customer have been prioritized, it is time to find the decision maker. So depending on the business, but in this lumber project, purchasing managers were sought. So if they were not available, other executives were targeted. The desired information included title, name, email, phone number, and LinkedIn profile. So searching for this information can be time consuming. So it is important to carefully consider what is truly needed. So a few words about uh, distribution agreements. So um, distribution agreements are often a critical part of enabling success. And these agreements entail obligations and rights, as we know. So like in any successful relationship, it must be a win-win situation. It will come to an end. So on this slide, uh, a few common challenges that often arise are listed uh, based on my experience here in the uh, North American market. And I'm, I would say that there are lots of similarities uh, to other markets as well, if not even the same. But the principal wants to add too many distributors and too quickly. Getting rid of bad agreements is difficult. So even when results are not achieved, Distributors often want the exclusivity, which is in most cases is a poor option for the principal. And what happens if, uh, if the agreement is terminated by the principal? So does it lead to legal disputes? So I think those are very important things to consider and, and try to think ahead of uh, time before writing those agreements. And as a small tip, um, starting distribution uh, with Amazon business before other channels can be beneficial. So I know that you, you have um, Amazon in Sweden, so you are to some extent some familiar with it, but we have also Amazon business. So look that up. And if, if, if done up the other way around, it is likely to upset the distributors. So this... Uh, I really recommend to look into this first and then open those distributor, distribution channels first if it's applicable to your business. So check it, check that out first. So now uh, let's move on to the next sec uh, section, which is a business culture. So a little uh, over two years ago, there was a news article uh, that is a great example where understanding local culture is important. So I bring it up um, as an example to illustrate that even being a citizen, but also born and raised uh, in Canada, doesn't, doesn't necessarily ensure that you understand the business culture in your own home country. So some people might think that after uh, a, doing 20 business trips uh, uh, helps them to understand the local cop culture. Um, it is to some, some extent uh, untrue, so most probably, yeah, most, most probably that's not the case. But in this news article, it is reported um, how the CEO of Air Canada gave a speech in English in the province of Quebec. And as, as some may know, Canada is a bilingual country and Quebec is a French speaking area. So as a result of the speech, a major controversy arose and there were strong de demands for his resignation. So the CEO made a somewhat thoughtless uh, comment regarding the language issues and significant uh, consequences can arise from a relatively small matters, or at least they are, as a European, it can be perceived as a small matter, but uh, but not but in this case it wasn't so in this case uh, he was able to keep his job but he needed to start taking french lessons and and that was uh, how he overcome and uh, became the challenge and uh, he was able to keep his job so cultural differences are often underestimated and understanding or misunderstanding them can have a significant uh, implications as i mentioned just a moment ago the challenge lies in the fact that only some aspects are visible or easily observable. So such as clothing, language, etiquette, laws, etc., those are easily observable. 
So these aspects can be learned relatively quickly, even during business or leisure trips. However, this is just a scratching the surface. So values, traditions, beliefs, philosophy, ethics, morality, life purpose, and other deeply rooted culture factors are more difficult to perceive. So these elements shape the way people think, behave, and perceive the world, and they require deeper understanding and appreciation to navigate cultural differences successfully. So when it comes to, uh, co comes to conducting business abroad in a foreign environment, in order uh, for the business to run smoothly, we must understand each other. So in, in, that, in addition to understanding, we also need to learn to live with our partner from uh, the other culture. So it is indeed challenging to learn to understand one another, but learning to live with uh, the other party is even more challenging. And I'm referring to the, the distribution agreements here. So we can either try to change the local culture or try to adapt ourselves to the local culture. And I have, of, I have often heard Europeans being labeled as a bit uh, arrogant. Part, partly this uh, stems from the technological advancement a sense of superiority and communication shortcomings. So if a client uh, starts feeling inferior or similar sentiments, it is not a good starting point for, for collaboration. Therefore, I suggest trying to understand way, why things are done the way they are. There are usually reasons behind certain practices, although not always. It is better to build your uh, knowledge of history Doing things differently doesn't necessarily mean better or worse, but rather it's just different. So understanding uh, the other part is important because uh, it demonstrates professionalism as a collaborative uh, partner. So in many industries, the mindset is quite different from Europe. And here is a general example of how things are perceived differently in Europe. People laugh at the ridic ridiculously large cars people drive uh, in North America. However, there must be some reason reasoning behind it. After all, people are not foolish here either. One of the best-selling vehicles is the Ford F-150, shown in the picture. Uh, it may sound crazy, but there are several reasons for this, apart from the status symbol. For example, the vast distances and harsh conditions necessitate uh, a durable vehicle. If it breaks down, it is better to have a quick access to spare parts and skilled mechanics. Moreover, Nordic uh, cottage, cottage uh, uh, culture doesn't exist here in the same way. And instead of uh, trailer, travel is the thing. So if a family has only one car, it is better to have a versatile one. So, and gasoline is cheap, so it doesn't matter if the car is uh, fuel thirsty. It is also important to remember that the population in North America is uh, of European descent, and over the years they have learned to adapt uh, adapt to the local uh, environment. So in this picture, the differences between the West and East are uh, depicted. In the West, uh, things are more casual, while in the East, they are more formal. So leisure time is emphasized in the West, where whereas work is emphasized in the East, and these same findings apply to Canada. Perhaps a couple of uh, more notable differences uh, that I have observed. Canadian mindset towards risk-taking is more risk averse compared to the US. This naturally has an impact on the speed of deal-making. So the time is money mentality is more pronounced in the US, in Canada, customers don't necessarily tell you uh, that they are not going to buy from you as you try, as um, they try to avoid hurting feelings or they want to be polite or something along those lines. So quite a big difference between between uh, those two countries. Now I'm generally uh, generalizing a bit, but uh, I have discussed with many of my friends and uh, these are sort of verified or valid findings that I validated uh, through my networks. Also, Canadians are most more humble uh, compared to Americans. So as the final topic, we have communication, presentation, and some sales techniques. 
So one of the most significant areas of development I would highlight is communication. So in this aspect, one can never be too good. It is important to remember that Canada has a population close to around uh, 38 million people. Their backgrounds are diverse and salespeople should speak to them differently. So considering their background and phone conversation are a whole different challenge. So the risk of misunderstanding is even greater due to the language barriers and small nuances, misinterpretation can easily occur or people may perceive the other party as rude. So it is crucial to remember that, that they draw conclusions based uh, solely on what they hear. Uh, uh, your words and tone of voice is, is very, very important. So intonations or other emphasizes placed on specific words are extremely important. So compared to Europe, it is indeed much more important uh, to focus on how you say something rather than what you say. So based on op my observations in Finland, about 80% of the weight is given to the uh, content and 20% to how you say it. So monotone and neutral speech is quite normal in North America. However, the weight of things can be perhaps 50-50. In this example, there is seven word, uh, seven word sentence where the meaning changes drastically depending on which word is emphasized when spoken. So in North America, I have noticed um, a mentality where people tend to buy more from someone they like rather than solely based on raw facts. That's why I want to say a few words about friendliness. Additionally, I want to mention a few words about the silent signals. Things are not communicated very directly here. So in friendliness and especially in soft skills, we are always a bit behind the locals. That's why we need to outshine them in our substan sub sub uh, substantive uh, expertise. So developing our soft skills requires effort and we should try to close the gap as best as we can. Could, would, and please are ex extremely important. Conditional and please in the same sentence, uh, just to be sure. So it's uh, it's also even even more important in England, but uh, but in Canada it is sort of uh, uh, some some extent similar. Small talk is important, and if you are a good enough communicator, adding some humor can be effective. Canadians and Americans overall enjoy louder and smiles. When conducting sales presentations, uh, using a storytelling uh, approach is important. So additionally, the presentation should be educational. The communication should be consultative and dialogic rather than just a lecture style delivery. Here is a highly recommended book that I suggest uh, reading. Um, it introduces a sales approach based on educating the customer. So check it out, The Ultimate Sales Machine by Chet Holmes. In presentations, it is important to focus on customer benefits rather than just the product features. Benefits should be quantified whenever possible. So unfortunately, it is uh, uh, not often seen in practice in, in, uh, in many presentations that I come across with clients. Active listening and uh, asking relevant questions uh, based on the customer's needs are crucial in sales. And it is important to truly understand the customer's requirements in order to provide appropriate solutions. So put more focus on, on listening and uh, less in talking and uh, dig into the customer needs and pain points and uh, then then provide the right solutions like I always refer to doctor examples so if you walk in uh, to doctor's office and if they are handing out without asking anything uh, uh, painkillers maybe that's not the not the best approach so try to apply similar principle uh, 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 with your clients ask more and uh, and uh, then listen carefully so that's the uh, end of my presentation. Thanks for taking the time and uh, and I'm handing over back to Sabrina. Thank you so much, Jukka. Uh, very interesting. And we see a lot of synergies between the Nordic companies and, and uh, the Canadian and Northern American 
uh, companies. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you here today since we also have been working with you both with the Finnish and Swedish companies of the northern parts of Finland and, and Sweden. Uh, I would like to give the word to Magnus, but I will share the presentation first. You're so welcome. Thank Magnus uh, is our expert from uh, from the Embassy of Canada in Sweden and will talk about the investment and business opportunities in Canada. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here and talk a little bit about, about Canada. And thanks, Yuka, for a very interesting um, presentation. I absolutely agree with your comments on the business culture and the, the differences between West and East uh, in Canada. I would I would just nuance a little bit the, the comment about Quebec at the risk of uh, so that we, we don't want to put anybody off of, of Quebec. Um, for an executive uh, like the CEO of, of Air Canada to, to 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 do a speech like that in 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 Quebec and not do it in French is an absolute faux pas, as as he should have said. But for anybody coming and looking to do business in in Quebec, not so much rural Quebec, but in Montreal, uh, for sure, it, it's not going to be a problem if you don't speak French. For any sort of official um uh, launch it's it's uh, good to speak to french uh to stick to french but um you can absolutely conduct business in in english i don't speak french myself it's 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 rarely been an issue in my job and deal with people in quebec a lot anyway uh briefly about myself minus i'm a senior investment officer for global affairs canada based at the embassy in sweden as you said sabrina but i cover all of the nordic markets and my job is to drive investments from this part of the world into Canada. The companies that would otherwise uh, consider the UK, US, Germany, wherever, it's my job to make sure that Canada is on that map and hopefully uh, help you land in, in Canada. Um, we are, as an organization, the Trade Commissioner Service sits under Global Affairs Canada. And, and in a Swedish context, it's... Um, convenient to compare ourselves to our friends at uh, Business Sweden. Uh, there are some fundamental differences, but it, it basically the same mandate in driving export from Canada into the rest of the world, which is what the majority of the organization does. Um, but also, thank you, Yuka. But also um, um, foreign direct investments from um, the rest of the world into Canada, which is, like I said, what I do myself. Right, next slide, please. So this is just a little map that I like to begin with, uh, and it shouldn't be four, but to sort of present the scale of Canada. It is an absolutely humongous country. 38 million people is, is significant. It's a, big, it's a big market, absolutely. But in terms of geography, it is massive. So you see I've placed, if the purple bit looks familiar, it's, it's Sweden can fit into the province of Quebec about two and a half times um, and Sweden is not a small country, as you're all aware. So it, it's a it's a very very big country. I don't want to um, make anybody feel that it's it's a daunting prospect. And Yoko mentioned this as well. It's it, it's good to approach Canada um, in portions to focus on a province, focus on a city, and which one to focus on will depend very much on what kind of business you're in. Um, if you're in ag tech, you may want to look at uh, Saskatchewan, for example. If you're in in ag tech, you would look at um, either of the coasts, especially Nova Scotia. I see, by the way, that New Brunswick is missing from this map. My apologies if there's anybody from New Brunswick on this on this call. Um, actually, go to the next slide. So it can be a little bit. Um, can you change the slide, Sabrina, please? Yeah. So this shows briefly the FDI ecosystem of Canada. So. Uh, first of all, I should mention Canada is a confederation. So I sit on the federal level with Global Affairs Canada, but then there are 10 provinces and three territories, each of which has so there's 10 uh, provincial governments, each of which has an investment promotion agency, and a lot of the cities have uh, investment promotion agencies as well. So my job is very much to, in conversation with companies such as companies on, on, on this call, um, uh, looking at the, the, what kind of business you're in, drivers for investment to look at where in Canada might make more sense. And then in conversations with people in the provinces and down to the cities, um, gather all the data that you need to make that intelligent uh, decision of, of, of where to set up. So we will typically send out requests to various 
provinces or cities to come back with a, a deck for you to have a look at and that would answer all the questions that you have about um, that would be important for you to know when you make a decision on on where to be um, where to be based and obviously benchmark that against other markets that you may be looking at um, at as well but this, this can seem like a bit of a uh, a bit of a mess sometimes and it is but we work very closely i work very closely with with um, all of the provinces and, and cities in, in um, and everybody has the same goal of, of having a Canada first approach and then trying to win investments for their respective um, territory. Next, please. Okay, so this this list could be very long. I've I've deliberately kept my presentation on pretty high level because I don't know who exactly is on the call. Um, I could have made this more specific to a, a, an industry or sector, but I'm going to keep it pretty pretty general and then happy to answer any any questions um, after the presentation, of course. So, why Canada? Market access, stability, sustainability, competitive, uh, competitiveness, and, and talent. These are uh, sort of the, the five major points that I've chosen to build this presentation around. Uh, so let's let's start with the next slide. Market access. So Canada has a, a history of being a progressive trading nation and very open to trade. Um, so currently has 15 trade agreements uh, covering 50 over 50 countries and, and as you can see, a huge amount of customers worldwide. So some of the key ones are CETA, of course, with the European Union, CPTPP with uh, a number of nations in South America and um, Asia Pacific. Uh, and of course, a big one, which used to be called NAFTA, sometimes still called NAFTA 2. Um, from a Canadian perspective, it's called CUSMA, the Canada-US-Mexico Agreement. Uh, USMCA, I think, is the more common um, acronym that you will see. But basically, the free trade agreement with Canada, the US, and Mexico, which is absolutely crucial, of course, for Canada in, in being a big, tra big trading nation and, and um, the US being the absolutely most important partner, of course. An excellent transportation of infrastructure with seaports, land ports, rail across Canada and into the US, uh, and of course, um, air, air cargo as well. So you can really, with a base in Canada, companies have access to, to the world through, through all of these trade agreements and through uh, the transportation infrastructure. Uh, and of course, a lot of companies set up in Canada to have access to the U.S. market. And we see increasingly um, companies based in Canada, but before they're based in the U.S., so the, especially um, software companies can service the U.S. market from a base in, uh, in Canada. And there's various reasons why they choose Canada with the U.S., and I will get into that a little bit later in the presentation. Next, please. Stability. Um, perhaps not the most exciting uh, <laughs> subject, but it's it's uh, I think increasingly important important some of these some of these uh, so economic fundamentals. It's a very it's a very stable country. It's um, it's got one of the strongest projected growth rates in in the G seven. It bounced back fairly quickly from the pandemic in terms of uh, employment rate. Um, of course, Canada is not immune to inflation. You see it everywhere, but the the, the numbers are, are relatively low. I think it's around six percent, six seven percent. Um, it has the lowest debt in, in the G seven for for about fifteen years. It's a very solid um, economic fundamentals um, and the financial system as well. Very stable banks. The top six seven banks in North America are all Canadians. You don't see there's been some turbulence in the American banking sector lately. You you rarely see this in in Canada. Political stability is not something I used to speak about five, six years ago, but it is um, it is an important aspect for the long-term view. And I think, especially for Canada, in having the um, current of a federal, um, liberal federal government led by uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, as you know, and then across Canada, these, these provincial governments that I mentioned earlier, it's a mix. There's liberal, there's um, bloc of Bois, there's there's conservatives. But what you will find is that when it comes to business and openness to foreign investments, uh, nothing fundamentally changes with elections. So as as an investor with a long term view, you can rely on 
uh, being able to conduct business in Canada in a safe and stable way, regardless of, of who's in power. Quality of life is another thing that I didn't use to talk about. This is this is a key part of the pitch for my, my colleagues in, in other parts of the world. Um, typically, I will find that when you have Canada, I think it's number three on the list of best places to live. Sweden <laughs> tends to be uh, either just above or below. But I think it's an important aspect to keep in mind as um, a, a, an easy country to uh, feel welcomed in. Uh, it has to do with um, the, the alignment on business culture and just values in general. It is essentially, it's, uh, if you, if you, as companies set up in Canada, open an office and need to bring key staff over from 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 Sweden to open the office, it's typically not difficult to get people to want to move to Canada with their families and and. Uh, and live there for a bit or or for a long while. Um, so it is it is still an important aspect. Uh, next, please. Sabrina. Uh, just some some numbers. So yeah, it's 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 an easy country in which to do business. It's easy to incorporate and start doing business. There's there's a few there's different ways to do that you can incorporate provincially or federally not a massive difference pretend if you if you incorporate provincially then you you have a license to do to operate business elsewhere but typically um at least clients that i work with will will incorporate federally so we can do business all across canada he has the best educated workforce in the world um over 60 percent of canadians have some some kind of post-secondary education uh, steady population growth. Canada grew by about four hundred thousand, just over four hundred thousand citizens last year. About two thirds of that is uh, labor, labor immigration. So the the Canadian workforce, the talent pool is 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 growing, and the target is about five hundred thousand new Canadians every year. Um, solid support for R and D. There's there's federal. Um, Science research and education tax credits, uh, often a provincial uh, tax credit as well that you can stack on top of that. There's uh, there's various grants and incentives, especially for in clean tech and and um, zero emission technologies. Um, and there's something called the Strategic Innovation Fund, which is the the federal government's vehicle for the typically larger projects of long term strategic projects where. Uh, um, Typically around big R and D projects in in Canada, where federal, provincial, and company co co funded in in consortiums, mm -hmm. um, and competitive tax rates um, on corporate to corporate tax rates around. I'm not going to say the number completely. I forgot the number, but it's it's. I think when you, I'll get back to that if anyone has questions about specific um, tax rates. But it's it's a competitive. It's there's no uh, no major impediments to do uh, to do business in Canada. Next slide, please. Sustainability. So this has become a big one, as Sabrina you mentioned the green green transition earlier. And as companies look to go green and and um, decarbonize in various ways, Canada has become a very attractive market for for various reasons. Um, but first of all, the Canada Canadian government itself has ambitious targets to be net zero by 2050. So it, it it's quickly rolling out um, new new clean technologies. So there, there's big investments in onshore and offshore wind and solar, uh, in, in Alberta, not least. Very big solar parks are being under development. Um, fuel cell and hydrogen technology, CCUS. There's Lots of different areas uh, in this case where with interesting big projects across uh, across uh, Canada. So opportunities for for companies in in that space. To begin with, Canada has a very clean grid, so you have uh, huge um, access to to um, hydro in Canada. So uh, provinces like Quebec, Manitoba, British Columbia are, are nearly one hundred percent hydro, especially Manitoba and uh, and Quebec. Have a big uh, in in the is a uh, significant part that's that's nuclear, um, very similar mix to what we used to in, in Sweden and Finland. But 
if the choice is between Canada and setting up somewhere in the US, then this is a very competitive advantage where a lot of US states still rely on coal and, and gas for a lot of their uh, electricity generation. So we see companies that are in any kind of manufacturing that is looking to decarbonize us are, are, are definitely looking to, to Canada. Uh, it's a very good place to be. Um, a green incentives, not least with the um, the budget that came out in the spring, there were new uh, tax credits for uh, battery production, for hydrogen production. This is very much a response to the U.S. Uh, Inflation Reduction Act that was released last year, and so this was very much Canada's response and being continued to be uh, an attractive um, destination for this this type of, of investment projects. Mines to mobility is a very interesting it's a strategy to attract investments into Canada's electric vehicle uh, battery supply chain. So anything from, from extracting minerals to processing to um, cell manufacturing, actual EV assembly, and all the way through to recycling. So uh, Canada is already a, a major automotive uh, industry. So there's there's five... OEMs in, in Canada, you got Honda, Ford, General Motors, Toyota, and Stellantis. So there, there's a significant um, automotive industry in, in Ontario, specifically, about 700 uh, auto parts suppliers. So that's already there. All of these five OEMs have announced um, production of EV electric vehicles in, in Canada. So the strategy, Minds to Mobility, is to, the, the vision is to have these companies produce vehicles in Canada where everything from the raw material to the finished product, everything is, is, is produced in Canada. So it's, it's possible to do this. Canada has all, it's the only place in the Western Hemisphere that has all the critical minerals, metals, and rare earths that is needed to produce batteries. Um, the automotive cluster and the know-how is already there. The clean grid is there to be able to do this in a very clean way. Um, a lot of the processing of, of the raw materials is, is done in China at this point, not just back to Canada, but um, this strategy is all about bringing those investments into Canada. And it's not just on paper. So this 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 uh, picture here shows something called Project Arrow, which is a, it, it was the, the Auto Parts Manufacturers Association of uh, Canada brought together, I think 54 members came together to show that this was possible to do in reality. So. This is a car, an EV that exists, that is 100% done in Canada using Canadian uh, raw material processed in Canada. It's a, this is an extremely expensive vehicle. I think it's something like $2 million. So it's a prototype, but it shows that it is possible. In the long run, this is, this is efficient to have, um, have the entire supply chain in, in Canada. Um, so next slide. Okay, talent. This uh, this is my favorite topic. So I already mentioned the best educated for workforce in in the OECD. Some really great. So you start in there, you already have a good talent, homegrown talent pool through coming through top universities. So Canada has a very loud neighbor to the south, as you're aware. I think people on this call will be aware of. Harvard and Yale and Princeton and, and, and MIT, et cetera. We're less familiar with McGill, McMaster, uh, University of Col British Columbia, University of Toronto, but fantastic, great universities producing about 500,000 graduates every year. And traditionally, there's been a, a um, history in Canada focusing on, on, on STEM and R&D uh, capabilities for about... Uh, 130,000 STEM graduates every year in Canada and a total pool of, of nearly 3 million people that have that type of, of, um, of uh, the, the, the graduated from one of these programs. So there is a huge talent pool for companies to, to tap into in Canada for that type of, of jobs. Diversity is also a, a key strength. Um, I mentioned the, the hundreds of thousands of people coming to Canada each year. Over 200 million, uh, sorry, over 200 languages are, are spoken in um, in Canada, aside for obviously from the main languages of, of English and French. 
And um, in, in a place like Toronto, where actually over half the population of Toronto is born in a different country, you can find any skill in basically any language. So for tech companies that need to do sales and services support globally, you can find anybody that you need in, in, in Canada and service the, the world from, from there. So it's a, it's a huge strength for, uh, for Canada. It truly is a, a country of, of, of immigrants. The Global Skills Strategy is a federal government program which, um, which has been created to make it easier and quicker for companies based in Canada, so these could be subsidiaries of Swedish or Finnish companies, to bring in talent from overseas. So there's a recognition that there's a huge uh, and rich talent pool in Canada, but there are specific jobs especially where um, the government has recognized that you can you cannot have too many of these. So there's a program within the global skill strategy called the Global Talent Stream, which is a list of jobs, all of them related to, to software in some capacity, or computer engineers, statisticians, mathematicians, software developers, etc. Uh, that as an employer, you don't need to do what's called a labor market impact assessment, which you otherwise need to do in showing that a Canadian couldn't do the job that you are, are posting. You don't need to do that with these jobs because it's just recognized that, yeah, we need to bring in more people like these. So you, you can do that very quickly in about two, the, 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 the target is two weeks. It's sometimes quicker, but around two weeks to get a work permit for these people and bring them in from anywhere in the world, provided obviously all the other necessary paperwork is in, is in order. And there's also a program called the um, Dedicated Service Channel, which I've used with, uh, with clients from here, which is a... Uh, considered service through IRCC, Immigration, Refugee and uh, Citizen Canada, where companies that make a substantial investment in Canada have a dedicated desk officer within IRCC to help out with, with the paperwork and making it easy to bring in people to, um, to Canada. So this is something that, that has been not least used by US companies that need to uh, bring in people from overseas, and it's been too difficult to do that in, in the US. <clears throat> so they've set up offices north of the border, not necessarily because they need to, not necessarily to service Canada, but it's simply easier to bring in people from, uh, from uh, the rest of the world to Canada than it is to the US. Uh, next slide, please. I think it's just a um, brief overview of some recent announcements, exactly. Um, just, just a few examples of, of Swedish companies that have set up in Canada in the last couple of years, or last year. So you, as a Seneca, obviously British, Swedish uh, announced uh, uh, an expansion of their, their research hub in Mississauga with some 500 new jobs focusing on, on rare diseases. So this is very much a result on the access to talent, but also some of the R&D uh, incentives and grants that, are, that, that exist within, within Canada. Mentimeter is, uh, you may be familiar with, a Swedish SaaS company that is a rare case, at least up until recently, of, of a company that, that set up in Canada as a first location outside of, of Sweden. Typically, they would have gone through the UK, the US, and, and somewhere else, but they went straight to, to Canada, opened up with eight people. I think they're currently 40 and looking to be 150 in, in a few years' time, so doing very well in Canada and servicing the, the US market from their office in, in Toronto. Klarna announced an engineering hub in February of last year. Um, creating 500 jobs um, when, when they build to capacity. This was their first engineering hub outside of Europe and also very much done to tap into the talent in, uh, in, in, in Canada. Ericsson announced in April a project through the Strategic Innovation Fund that I, that I mentioned earlier. So this is a R&D project along with uh, the, the government of Canada creating a couple of hundred jobs in, in Ottawa and investing $500 million uh, over, the last, over the next five years. Centiro is a company out of Boros that opened in, uh, in Montreal, speaking of Quebec, in, uh, in last year, uh, and, and, and starting small there, but, but growing very well. Uh, they actually had previously, or still do, but they had an office uh, already in, in Boston, but had some issues in bringing talent in, to, to the US market. So that was very much a, a reason why they, they decided to also set up in, in Canada. 
So that's about it for me. Uh, as I said, it's a high level overview. Happy to take questions. Happy to set up an, a, a follow up meeting or call to discuss in more detail what kind of business you're in and what you might want to know about about Canada. And I can, I can explain a bit more about how we how we do. But that was uh, yeah, that was what I had to talk about today. And that's me and my contact details. If you need to reach me, and of course, very easily find on LinkedIn as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Magnus. Uh, really interesting to to learn more about from your perspective also. And great to hear also that you're working from the Nordic perspective, as Jukka told in the beginning. So we have a lot of synergies. Um, I would like to introduce uh, Business Sweden as the next uh, uh, next uh, speaker. And uh, it is Christina. Kielgren, that is country manager that starts and then Patricia Berg Jensen, project manager, will come after her also and tell more about Business Sweden in Canada. Thank you so much, Severina, and uh, thank you, Jukka and Magnus. I, I don't know what possibly more I can uh, tell you because <laughs> the two of you covered a lot of different aspects and very good points on, on, on Canada. And uh, so um, I, I will do our presentation, but uh, uh, we will overlap a, a few of, of the information there, but uh, it might be good for a, a repeat as well. Um, but uh, I am, uh, as Sabrina said, I'm the country manager for Business Sweden. I am uh, located or our office is located in Toronto. Uh, but I'll give you here a, a little bit of an overview who Business Sweden, uh, uh, who, who we are. And uh, our mission is, of course, to help Swedish companies to grow global sales, uh, but also to support international and foreign companies to invest and expand in Sweden. Uh, we are a truly global organization. We are present in over 40 markets um, and, and growing. We have opening up a, a, a few more offices. Uh, we actually just announced this week we will be opening up an office in, in Ukraine. Um, but in Canada, we have an office in Toronto. Uh, in US, we have four offices, San Francisco, Chicago, New York, and Washington, D.C., uh, we are an organization with about 500 employees and growing, and uh, that's about 50 more than we were uh, a year ago. Uh, we've been around for about 50 years, and we are 50% owned by the Swedish government and 50% owned by the Swedish uh, industry. So quite a unique uh, setup. Um, so what do we do? Um, we help, like I said, uh, Swedish companies to grow their international sales. And we do that in many different ways, um, such as uh, market expansion, sales acceleration, business to government. And another service we have is business incubation and operations, uh, something that Business Sweden is quite unique uh, with offering that type of service where we uh, companies can rent office space from our offices abroad. They can utilize our staff to do their finance, controlling, uh, employment, HR services, and, and incorporation. And that's a popular service uh, in North America. Uh, our office have about 35 Swedish companies that are um, uh, using that service. But otherwise, we help Swedish companies with the global expansion strategy, market entry, and, and uh, even merger and acquisition sometimes. We work as business management consultants. Uh, we do charge for our services. However, we do also have a lot of uh, subsidized services for small and medium-sized companies. And I will tell you a little bit more about that later. This is our office in Toronto. There's eight of us uh, led by myself. I have lived in Canada for over 30 years, uh, been with Business Sweden for about 25 or more. And I've been with uh, in this position for the past three years. Uh, but we have an amazing, talented team uh, with many different backgrounds, uh, both uh, Swedish, Canadian, and from other countries as well. Um, so we have been here also for about 50 years. 
And um, the industries that we uh, are focusing on where we see synergies and, um, and also uh, opportunities are the mining industry, forestry, advanced manufacturing, healthcare, and food and retail. And we will talk a little bit more on the mining industry. Uh, my colleague Patricia will talk about that. So uh, just like Magnus said in his presentation, uh, Canada is a large country uh, in size. Uh, it is uh, covering five time zones or six time zones. It takes about five and a half hours to fly from east to west. And um, uh, as you can see there on the map, Sweden, you can you can sort of fit it into Quebec, but Quebec is uh, two times or two and a half times is bigger uh, still. So um, it is uh, a country though with many similarities uh, with the Nordic region and with, with Sweden, uh, such as the weather and the love for hockey. Uh, I can say that uh, just like Jukka was talking, it's, it's good to have some small talk. Hockey is always a good, um, uh, conversation piece uh, to talk about hockey players uh, in Sweden and Canada. Uh, everyone knows the Swedish hockey players like Salming, Mats Sundin, Alfredsson, uh, Sedin brothers, and, and so forth. Um, but yes, I'm not going to go on more about that. There, there are uh, similarities, but uh, uh, size and population is, is two things that are, are different. So uh, just like Magnus was was mentioning, uh, why are we um, uh, why why Canada? Why is Canada an attractive market? And and I think Magnus brought up some really really good points that we have on our list as well. Um, uh, Free trade agreement. We have the CETA agreement between Europe and Canada. It's the most comprehensive free ag ag trade agreement in the world uh, and is beneficial for both Swedish and Canadian companies. Um, two companies that are culturally similar, um, both in business and, and uh, socially, uh, as well as the four season uh, and, and the natural resources. Uh, a government that uh, provides a lot of incentives and um, especially for R&D and uh, Magnus did mention some of the investments, but a large, uh, a lot of companies are investing more in Canada because of, of that, because they have that government support. And the talent pool. Yes, Canada can boost with a very strong and diverse talent pool. Um, and uh, uh, I often talk about how how Toronto has oh, 51 percent of, of Canada. Uh, Toronto's population comes from outside of Canada. Uh, and uh, Magnus mentioned that as well. Uh, very unique and um, and celebrated. I should say the integration has been uh, well done in, in Canada. And then we have the gateway to the US market. Of course, Canada and US are very integrated when it comes to trade. I think about 78% of Canadian export is going to the US. So of course, very uh, dependent on the US market. Um, but US is also dependent on Canada. So uh, very integrated, but it is um, a gateway for Swedish companies wanting to uh, to tackle the North American market, um, starting in Canada is a very good, good thing. And uh, we see that often Swedish companies start their operation in Ontario, uh, in southern Ontario, and then grow the business um, and then have, but then go into the U.S. And I know, for uh, instance, Mentimeter that uh, invested and opened up an, an office in Toronto uh, a couple of years ago. The reason why they choose Canada was because of the talent pool, the diversity, uh, you know, stable uh, economy. Uh, but their clients were actually in the U.S., uh, but they decided that we want to be in, uh, have our office in, in Canada. And then a uh, political stable government, uh, democracy, minimal civil unrest and, and, and all that. Uh, but I think Magnus covered that as well. I think I'm going to skip this. We, we talked about the CEDA agreement. 
It is the most comprehensive trade agreement in the world. It's been in place now for five, six years. Um, the, the highlight, I think, from, from that is the tariffs that were uh, taken away. 98% of, of the tariffs were eliminated. And, um, and that had an impact on, on certain sectors. Every year we ask uh, Swedish companies in Canada uh, how their business is doing, it's something called the Business Climate Survey. We've done that for four years in a row now. And uh, Swedish companies' view of Canada is that uh, they are making a profit in Canada. It's a fair and sustainable place to do business. Um, I think 67% uh, of the Swedish firms actually plan to increase their investment in Canada in the next coming 12 months. So I would say that the Swedish companies have a really good footprint in Canada and they are doing, doing well. Oops, how do I go back here? Let's see, there. Um, so... We, I, I just want to mention some of the industries where we, where we are a little bit more proactive, where we see similarities between Sweden and Canada. And uh, as I mentioned before, forestry, mining, advanced manufacturing, consumer goods are four of those sectors. Uh, Canada has a, a large forest sector. Almost 10% of the world forest is in Canada. And it is the fourth largest, uh, largest um, forest pro uh, product product ex exporter in, in value. Uh, the mining industry is, is uh, I mean, here, Canada is uh, a powerhouse when it comes to, to mining. Um, over 200 mines. Um, we have all the, the, the minerals and metals, or, or many of them in the world. And uh, I'll, I, Patricia will tell you a little more about the mining industry. The advanced manufacturing is strong in Canada, especially in Ontario, and uh, is ranked fifth on the Automation Readiness Index. And then the consumer goods and retail. I think Canadians have a really good appetite for consumer goods from the Nordic region. Um, uh, uh, interior design, uh, clothing, and uh, and brands are well liked and uh, uh, in Canada. Uh, just want to mention there is about uh, hundred Swedish companies, a little bit over hundred in in Canada. Many of them have been here for a long time. Uh, Ericsson is celebrating their seventieth anniversary this year. They opened their their office in nineteen fifty three. Uh, same thing with Alpha Laval. Um, uh, ABB, SKF, they have been also here for a long time. But then we have newcomers as well. And um, we did a survey a couple of years ago to see what is the economic footprint of the Swedish companies in Canada. And we found out, we, did, we didn't have this information before, but we found out that uh, close to over 30, 37,000 jobs are created by Swedish companies in Canada. And that's quite significant and it makes a difference. If you also count the indirect jobs that that is creating, it's over 100,000. And um, the largest companies you can see here uh, on the page is uh, Securitas, IKEA, Volvo, ABB. This is by employment numbers, I should say. The, it, uh, the figures will be a little bit different if you look at the revenue. Uh, yes. And then, uh, just like Magnus was saying, and I'm highlighting some of the, the great news that has been come out in the past few months, um, Swedish companies are investing more in Canada. Uh, AstraZeneca have uh, announced that they will expand their research and development facility in Mississauga, hiring 500 highly skilled scientific and, and uh, high-tech jobs. And that is linked to the to the to the the fact that they have a, 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 there's a big talent pool in in Canada, and Ericsson also announced that they are going to uh, invest over five hundred million. Uh, okay, someone changed the slide here. Um, and, and then lastly, but not least, Nova Bus, uh, part of uh, the Volvo Group, 
uh, they won a 2.2 billion contract with the uh, the province of Quebec for new electric buses. So they will be building uh, 1,230 electric buses in, in North America. That is the largest public tender in, in North America. So congratulations to all these uh, three companies that uh, have done really well and made some really cool uh, announcement lately. Okay, next slide. I will hand this over to to Patricia. Uh, she's sitting across the table here. Mm -hmm. We are actually in Sudbury right now, and Sudbury is the mining hub in in Canada, just like Kiruna is in Sweden. And we are uh, attending a, a conference called From Mine to Mobility. So just like Magnus was talking about, Canada has all the ingredients for the whole value chain uh, for, for the, the, the mine to mobility. And uh, this is a conference that are combining those two sectors, the, the mining industry and the automotive industry. So we have been listening in to speakers from Vale, Glencore, uh, uh, those mining companies. Today, we, we have uh, listened in to uh, speeches from Honda and Ford and uh, a lot of other organization because there is a, a big bus, I would say, around um, this whole, the, the battery value chain, the electrification uh, of the mining industry. So um, we are here, we're sitting in a small room. Patricia is across the table, but he, she will take over now and speak a little bit more about the Canadian mining industry. Yes, thank you so much, Christina. Um, yes, so as Christina mentioned previously, mining is one of our focus area here at Business Sweden and especially in Canada, of course, being such a big uh, mining powerhouse. Uh, so I just wanted to provide a bit of a deep dive um, to provide a bit of a background on the mining sector in Canada, as well as its importance. Um, so as you can see very briefly, just to give you a quick scan, um, mining industry is one of Canada's most uh, important economic sector. And it's also a major job creator. So it actually stands for even 5% of the GDP uh, calculated on direct and indirect uh, GDP. Um, and looking uh, on the mining industry from a more sort of global perspective, uh, there's a lot of investments going into Canada within uh, to the mining sector. And it is actually the top target for many regions around the world when it comes to uh, foreign direct investments, as you can also see in the, in the sort of lower graph here. Looking at the production in Canada, then Canada is the number one producer when it comes to potash. But not only that, Canada in total produces over 60 minerals and metals. Uh, so as you can imagine, it's a it's a lot of mines uh, in Canada, um, a bit over 200, as you can see here on the slide, and over 100 uh, different type of mine operators from uh, all around the world. Um, and just to sort of Piggyback over Christina said in regards to, to the Mines to Mobility Conference that we are currently attending, Canada does produce uh, and have all the minerals and metals uh, required to manufacture battery electric vehicles. Um, so Canada is currently building out that sort of whole value chain from raw materials processing being done in Canada as well as manufacturing of the battery electric vehicles and have the capacity to do so. Uh, looking at the Toronto Stock Exchange, which is the 10th largest exchange in the world, 50% um, of the global uh, mining and exploration companies are actually listed on the TSX. So it's a very mining uh, sort of heavy uh, stock exchange, if you will. I think we can maybe move over to the next slide here. Thank you. Um, so as Christina mentioned uh, quite a few times, and I think you have a pretty solid understanding of that now as well, is that Canada is a mining powerhouse. And that's specifically when it comes to the resources, so what it has in the bedrock, as well as the sort of technological development. And as you can see on the map here, a majority of the mines are in Quebec uh, and Ontario, so sort of in the eastern part of Canada. Um, it is a mix of both underground mines and open pits. So it's a rough 40-60% mix, if you will. Uh, and Canada's mine both metals and non-metals, and that's a rough 50-50% mix, just to give you an idea in terms of uh, the distribution. Canada also has very deep mines, uh, just like you might find in Sweden. Um, a, a bit a bit deeper, though, I have to say. Um, the deepest mines, some of the deepest mines in the world are located in Canada. And 
They have three uh, mines that are just below three kilometers. So we have Lagon, which is in Quebec, uh, as well as Kid Creek and Creighton uh, that are based uh, out of Ontario. And just to enforce further how important uh, Canada is in terms of its mining industry, um, Canada is actually home to 75% of world's mining and exploration companies. So what that means is that these companies would have their head headquarters in Canada. Uh, and then looking at the sort of technological development that Canada is currently doing uh, in the mining industry, Canada is actually uh, paving the way and taking the lead when it comes to mine electrification. Uh, so we do have a Borden mine, which is a fully electrified mine when it comes to a production fleet based out of Quebec. And then we have the Onaping Death project, which is going to be the world's most modern uh, underground mine. And it's going to be fully electrified, of course. And will be in operations uh, in 2025 uh, and based uh, out of Ontario, just to give you a little bit of a of a of a background. And looking at the right hand side here on the on the slide, um, we can see just a few sort of a snapshot of few some of the mining companies that are currently uh, present in Canada. Uh, and again, as you remember, it's over 100. So this is definitely not an exhaust list. This is just a few examples, and and I'm sure that you recognize many of these uh, big mining operators. But we also have uh, quite a few Swedish OEMs uh, that have uh, a big footprint in Canada. Um, you can see at the bottom slide here, just Epiroc itself uh, have over 2,100 employees just in North America. And I think we can move over to the next and final slide for the mining industry. Uh, so this is just to show you that Canada has players across uh, both public, uh, private sector, as well as academia. Um, so you would see associations, uh, you know, both on federal, but also on, on provincial level, uh, R&D hubs, as well as innovation centers. Um, and then, of course, we have a few other key influences, if you like to, that we like to refer them to as. So we have, uh, for example, NORCAD here that I want to highlight, which is a technology testing and demonstration facility, sort of an innovation center. Um, so as you might imagine, Canada has a very large uh, mining ecosystem with all these different players, uh, as well as the, um, as the resources in the bedrock, of course. So that together builds up for Canada's um, reputation as a large uh, uh, mining nation and, uh, and mining hub. But yeah, I think with that, um, I'll maybe hand it back over to you, Christina, to talk about one of the major events uh, that we have in the pipeline uh, this fall. Uh, I want to mention the, the Sweden Canada Innovation Day that we are um, organizing in, in one more slide back, uh, please. Um, it's happening on October 4th uh, in Montreal. Um, this is something we organize every year. Uh, it's on initiative from Vinova, and uh, Vinova has given us the task to organize it. And the overall theme is driving the green transition. And uh, this is giving Swedish and Canadian uh, companies a platform to network, present, and, uh, and meet. Uh, so we did that in September of last year in, in Toronto, and now we will do the same thing in Montreal. So um yeah let us know if you want to have more information about that uh, and like i said we we did it last year we had 130 uh, people attending about 60 people came from sweden 24 speakers 11 startups and canadian five canadian corporates it was a highly successful event and we are looking forward to to do this event again next slide I think we'll skip that mm -hmm. and then go to the next one. I, as I mentioned in the first, in my introduction, we do have some uh, programs for Swedish startups um, that are tailored to, to help small and medium-sized companies uh, subsidize services, uh, export coaching, export validation, export project, promotion activities, and export rules and regulation. Some of them are completely free of charge, and some of them are subsidized by 50%. So please let us know if you're interested. We, we can tell you a little bit more about those services. And our last slide, I uh, just want to emphasize on 
what uh, some takeaways that Swedish companies should think about when they are looking to Canada. Uh, and I think it ties in very much with what Jukka and Magnus have said in, in, in earlier. Um, plan to build long-term relationships and to be persistent. Don't give up. It takes time. Um, and uh, we also often talk about the additional layers of government complexity. The fact that we have as many layers of, uh, of government in Canada can sometimes be uh, a little bit cumbersome, but it is like all the provinces are very independent and uh, there could be laws that are different in each region. Um, also understand the need for the market and your company fit. I think Yuka talked about this a lot. You need to understand the market before you enter it. So do a lot of homework. Um, be aware of appropriate legal requirements um, that that might be uh, valid for your product. Uh, another thing is ca Canadians are risk adverse. I think Yuka talked about this and uh, we see this all the time. So bringing data, bringing statistics, business cases and research is a really good thing to do when you have when you're in dialogue with Canadians. And lastly, but not least, focus on your Swedish heritage. Canadians trust Swedish brands. Uh, it stands for quality, loyalty, uh, sustainability, not the least. Uh, and I think here is uh, the fact that Sweden uh, has a really good um, footprint in Canada because of that. Uh, and I think there's lots of opportunities. Uh, I know that Canadians and, and in particular Canadian government is looking to collaborate with like-minded uh, countries. And uh, Sweden is definitely one of, one of those countries that they want to work more with. Okay, I think I, I I managed within my time. I think we are a little bit delayed, but uh, happy to take some questions uh, mm -hmm. from the audience. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, and thank you to Yuka and Magnus and Patricia for uh, saying everything. I just want to say that this will be also available on the web so that you can look at it later. Um, I'd like to invite you all to offer three takeaways. Uh, for doing business in the Canadian market. Um, so if you want to start, maybe Yuka, you can give our uh, your three most important takeaways. Okay. Uh, so um, I would say that um, the communication is a key. So it takes practice, but the communication, if, if you don't know how to communicate, uh, uh, there is no way that you are going to succeed here. And I think... Uh, as, uh, as we earlier mentioned, the data is a key. So that we have lots of opportunities here, but how to find the ones? And I think the data is a key for that too. So, and um, I think um, leveraging uh, the high technology, what we have in Nordic countries. And I think there are lots of opportunities for that, but it's not easy to sell. The market is a bit uh, cost driven at, at times, but there are opportunities and let's uh, let's try to, um, so the next generation technology by educating the customers and data is also key for that. So. Thank you very much, Yuka and Magnus. There we go. Yeah. Well, first of all, I I'd, I'd, I'd say just don't forget that Canada exists. You know, I find that a lot of companies do, um, and it. It's not always on the roadmap of, of especially as companies start looking, you know, what the the, the, the US is, is the big price. And a lot of the time companies forget that Canada is, is you know, fantastically located to be a test market for, for North America and, and, and to be um, a stepping stone into into that market. Um, but also to so, so remembering that it's there and it's not as far away as it might seem. I think we are. I could have mentioned that um so i started last year there's actually direct flights that from from stockholm to toronto which i'm personally super happy about because my wife is from there and and i've connected through absolutely everywhere um <laughs> but uh, so so it's it's it, it's it's not as far away as one might think but but at the same time obviously it's not as as easy to cover as as 
the UK where you can pop in and out over the day and and and, and do some meetings. So, um, do you have work? Uh, do your homework. We we there, there's people on this call that you can contact to to uh, have a conversation and get an idea about where to uh, where 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 might be a good spot for you to, to set up in Canada. But then also go and visit and and meet with people um, and and see what it's like uh, and, and leverage your network again. Some some people are on this call that you can that you can consider a network already. Um, I I find that um, founders from the Nordics that I've set up in in Canada and um, or, or people that work for them that are from these markets that I've set up in Canada and and came over to build the operation they're super happy to speak with other companies that are looking to uh to do business in canada and learn learn and share share lessons learned and then i'm going to be very cheeky and just steal the one uh, one of the things that christina said about the the hockey diplomacy because this is something that i i don't tend to uh to do myself and i've, I've been across canada to to all the provinces and uh saying that on swedish this comes up all the time and i don't know um, hockey players very well, so I found that to be uh, that could have been a superb icebreaker, but I, I failed on that point. So, so lesson learned, and I'll share that with all of you. So please, please do your homework on on that as well. Pun intended with the icebreaker and hockey reference. <laughs> ah, I did not think about that. Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, if we can take it over to Christina and Patricia, do you have takeaways to give? Yes. Uh, yeah, my first one would be uh, uh, know your hockey players. <laughs> um, and uh, 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 like very, very good uh, uh, conversation to start with. Absolutely. Um, it is, it is a, a, a massive country geographically. And uh, uh, companies need to focus maybe on one or two areas. Don't don't think you will cover all of Canada in, in within the first year. So start small. Start with a with an area with a with the province and build from there. Um, it is a bilingual uh, country, so uh, take that in consideration. Uh, I think we've talked about that as well. And um, but it is a country with um, it's a country with like minded uh, views. Um, and and resources, so there are lots of opportunities. Um, I would say, so I think, and and more and more, uh, it's growing. We see more business, more collaboration between Sweden and Canada. So um, putting Canada on the map, yes, and I think I think things are are happening uh, on both sides where we see that that collaboration is, is happening. So yeah, the, I, I would say the the future is very bright and uh, uh, promising for for uh, Canada and Sweden. Thank you very much, Christina. Um, Patricia, do you have any any takeaways that you want to <laughs> close with? No, I think uh, thank you. No, I think Christina pretty much uh, covered it all. Um, like uh, one thing that stands out to me, though, uh, as an addition to what Christina just said, is that Canada and Sweden has very similar industries, prioritize similar industries like the forestry industry and the mining industry. And there's actually where we are right now in Sudbury, there's a very large Finnish population because they came here in the in the 50s um, to, to relocate. Um, and they had the skills and trades required uh, within forestry and mining. So again, uh, there, there's a lot of similarities between uh, Sweden and Canada. Um, obviously, everything that was mentioned prior prior to this, but as well as the industries in Sweden has a lot of skills and trades within this. So it's worth uh, it's worth highlighting and mentioning again. It's a good compliment. Great, thank you, mm -hmm. Patricia. Um, I would like to finish with some uh, concluding slides at the end. So I will just share my screen one more time. I would like to thank you all of our participants uh, for today's trade talk and also the ones that will be watching this afterwards when we will put it on our website and also on our YouTube channel. So you will, you will be able to watch it again if you want to. Um, 
I would also uh, want to say a special thanks to all of our experts from Nordic Trading House, from the Canadian Embassy and from Business Sweden. It has been a pleasure to be working with you. And I hope that this webinar also connects more companies uh, to get the advice and, and help from your organization when coming to the Canadian market. Um, Canada is a large market and we la have a lot of similarities as, as we have heard from the experts today. And uh, since we have been talking a lot about the hockey, that was also one of my final slides actually, because we have Canadian uh, players also in the team Lule Hockey here in Sweden, in northern part of Sweden, uh, like uh, uh, like Brandon uh, Schinemann that is where, uh, playing at the Lule Hockey and also uh, JC McWood that is coming to the Lule Hockey for the women's team uh, playing. But we also have a lot of Finnish players like Jenny Hirikoski that is playing here. And also a lot of big names as Christina also mentioned earlier, like Saku Koivu and Börje Salming that has been playing in Canada. So that's a really good conversation started and always something that, that we can share a lot of... Uh, uh, experience uh, from uh, at least right now Canada is in, in top two in both of those world championships. Um, so uh, please feel free to contact all of our experts from today's webinar and connect with them, uh, but also contact us at the Norrbotten Chamber of Commerce and uh, we'll see what we can do to support your uh, journey at the Canadian market. Uh, so thank you for Trade Talk Canada and thank you for everyone participating today. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.